All right, so this is part two of chapter 38, which is also pediatrics. All right, case study number two. EMTs Deb and Ben arrive on the scene of an eight-year-old who's struck by a car while riding her bicycle. The patient is lying in the street, shivering and crying. Deb can immediately see that her skin is pale and mottled and that there is swelling and deformity of her left thigh. All right, what's your general impression of this patient? Uh, what injury should be suspected with this mechanism of injury? And how should treatment of this patient be prioritized? All right. So, while we think about those things, all right, let's talk about some specific pediatric respiratory and cardiopulmonary conditions. All right. Creep. Creep is a common infection of the upper airway, usually caused by a virus, but sometimes by bacteria. It has... A slow onset of symptoms is accompanied by a low-grade fever and is most common in kids between six months and four years of age, all right? This presents with a seal bark cough, all right? That's going to be your uh, hallmark sign and symptom of that, <clears throat> all right? Uh, this is your uh, chart in your book, all right, Creep is figure A, uh, airway obstruction caused by creep, a viral illness that causes swelling of the upper uh, larynx lining, and B is epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is a bacterial infection that produces severe swelling of the epiglottis itself, okay? All right, creep, emergency care, administer oxygen, humidified if possible, keep the patient in a comfortable position, and transport without agitation, okay? Epiglotti epiglottitis, a condition that resembles creep. Epiglottitis is caused by a bacterial infection that inflames and causes swelling of the epiglottis. Epiglottitis is life-threatening. If left untreated, it has a 50% mortality rate. The onset is usually rapid and is accompanied by a high fever, okay? This is a rapid onset high fever, okay. Uh, specific signs and symptoms. You will see pain on swallowing, drooling, and mouth breathing, okay. They drool because they don't want to swallow. It hurts for them to swallow, all right. Um, that's going to be your hallmark sign of epiglottitis, the drooling and the mouth breathing. Uh, changes in voice quality, pain with speaking, chin and neck will be thrust forward, and inspiratory strider. Emergency care. Do not place anything in the child's mouth. Place the patient in a comfortable position. Uh, oxygen, binary breather mask, or blow-by method. Consider ALS, backup, and rapid transport. Okay. Uh, these kids, we do not want to agitate them at all. Uh, keep them as calm as possible because, if anything, um, upsets that epiglottis, it will swell and it will cause a complete airway obstruction, okay? All right, asthma. Asthma is a long-term inflammatory process that targets the lower airways. This inflammation is characterized by increased production of mucus and an acute narrowing of the airway through inflammation of airway tissue leading to edema or swelling in the airway, okay? Uh, hallmark sign of asthma is what? Wheezing, all right? Inflammation inside the bronchial, an increase in the production of thick, sticky mucus and bronchial smooth muscle contraction or bronchoconstriction leads to reduced bronchial internal diameter and a higher airway resistance, okay? Check out this uh, uh, little chart there in your book. All right, common signs and symptoms of asthma include shortness of breath, tight uh, chest tightness, wheezing, and non-productive tight cough, okay? Uh, wheezing is going to be, and a tight cough is going to be your hallmark signs and symptoms for asthma, okay? Yep. Although this is not an exhaustive list of necessary questions, these are examples of questions that can help gauge the severity of an asthma attack. How long have they been wheezing? Have they had a recent cold or other infection? Have they had any medication for this attack? If so, what, when? 
Does it seem to be any better? Do they have any known allergies to drugs, foods, pollens, or other inhalants? All right. In the assessment, you need to pay attention to their position, their mental status, vital signs, skin color, condition, and respirations. All right. A severe asthma attack cannot be managed with medication. It's called status asthmaticus and is extremely serious. And you need to have ALS backup on the way if available. Okay. Emergency management. Maintain oxygen to keep the pulse ox greater than or equal to 94%. Initiate positive pressure ventilation if the patient's condition deteriorates. Assist with a prescribed inhaler if they have it and transport to the emergency department. Bronchiolitis. The mucosal layer of the bronchioles is inflamed by a viral infection, usually RSV. All right, this produces wheezing and other signs and symptoms of asthma. There is usually a low-grade fever, often more predominant in patients less than two years of age. Okay, inflammation inside the bronchioles and an increase in production, just like asthma. All right, uh, asthma, you're probably not going to get a low-grade fever. Okay, depending on what else is going on with them. Uh, that's pretty much the hallmark sign of the uh, uh, bronchiolitis. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Bronchiolitis. Uh, place the patient in a position of comfort, monitor vital, monitor vital signs, and mental status en route, and consider ALS intercept. All right. <coughs> Mucus in. Uh, Pneumonia. Mucus inside the bronchioles leads to a reduced airflow, and mucus in the alveoli causes poor gas exchange. Okay. Uh, pneumonia is, is uh, an infection in the lungs, is estimated to cause approximately 4 million deaths among children worldwide. In the United States, from 1939 to 1996, mortality caused by pneumonia in children declined by 97%. This decline is most likely attributed to the introduction of antibiotics, vaccines, and improvement in medical care, and the expansion of medical insurance coverage for children. Pneumonia can involve bacterial, viral, uh, mycoplasmal, and fungal infections of the lungs. Okay. The child may lie on their side with their knees drawn up or assume a tripod position. With severe respiratory distress, the child will be exhausted. Children under two may lie on their back and may not show agitation. All right, they can be drowsy with intermittent periods of restlessness. Look for evidence of dehydration and cyanosis in the skin. Pulse rate may increase, but bradycardia is a sign of respiratory failure and potential cardiac arrest. Blood pressure may fall due to sepsis and shock. Monitor their SpO2. They will have diminished breath sounds and these wheezes or crackles in their lungs. Remember, crackles means fluid. All right. So this is going to be one of the hallmark signs of pneumonia in kids. All right. How are we going to treat it? Maintain the oxygen and keep their pulse ox greater than or equal to 94%. If they need it, use positive pressure ventilation. Place the patient in a position of comfort, transport, and consider ALS intercept. All right. Congenital heart diseases are responsible for more deaths in the first year of life than any other birth defect. Okay. And this is according to the National Institute of Health. The initial presentation of the infant with congenital heart disease can be inconsistent. Looking like respiratory distress, infection, failure to thrive, and shock. Okay. Because the deficit can be due to abnormal valves, vessels, or chambers, diagnosing the deficit is less important than recognizing the abnormality on assessment, initiating, initiating emergency care, and transporting rapidly to the appropriate medical facility. Okay. There is little that the EMT can do with congenital heart deficits other than support loss function during transport. And loss function is going to be maintaining an adequate oxygenation, support the cardiovascular system as necessary, and transport immediately or consider ALS intercept or backup. 
shock in pediatric patients. Causes include hypovolemia, obstructive, distributive, and cardiogenic. Less common causes of shock are allergic reaction, poisoning, or cardiac events. Common findings include diarrhea, dehydration, trauma, vomiting, blood loss, infection, and abdominal injuries. All right. There is a sign, uh, signs of shock in your book that you should be familiar with. Um, most of this is going to be the same as an adult. All right. Uh, the difference between compensated and decompensated, table 38.7. Uh, it's going to look at your pulses and cap refills as indicator of compensated versus decompensated. Okay. Shock. What are we going to do? Emergency care wise. Uh, maintain open airway and use oxygen. Uh, positive pressure ventilation if breathing is inadequate. Control bleeding if present. Keep the patient supine and warm and rapid transport and consider ALS intercept, okay? Also in your book, there is a pediatric shock protocol. Make sure you go over this and uh, check that out, okay? Cardiac arrest. Almost all cardiac arrests in children result, result from airway obstruction or respiratory distress leading to respiratory arrest. Shock is also a cause of cardiac arrest and aggressively manage both respiratory problems and shock before they progress into cardiac arrest. All right, your goal is to keep the brain viable. Standing orders that provide for orderly direction of treatment, easy access to paramedic backup and continuous assessment are important. Unless too much time has elapsed between the arrest and initial initiation of artificial ventilation, the child may recover with minimal or no neurologic deficit, uh, even following comparatively long periods of arrest. Okay, Signs of cardiac arrest include unresponsive, gasping or no respiratory sounds, no audible heart sounds, the chest is not moving, the chest is not moving, pallor, cyanosis, and they have absent pulses. Okay, uh, positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen, CPR and AED application, early ALS backup or intercept, and rapid transport. All right, we can use AEDs on kids and infants as long as they have the pediatric attenuators. All right, other medical conditions and emergencies. Seizures, abnormal electrical discharge that occurs in the brain. Seizures are a brain dysfunction with muscular manifestations, okay? The muscular manifestations that you see is usually that tonic-clonic movement, all right? The risk of seizure is high among children up to age two, and approximately three to five percent of all children in the United States will experience a febrile seizure by the time they reach their fifth birthday. Although childhood seizures can be frightening, they generally have no permanent adverse effects and usually do not predict the development of epilepsy in the child unless there's a family history of epilepsy and the seizure is particularly prolonged or difficult to control. All right, the most common cause of seizures in pediatric patients is the febrile seizures, okay? All right, during the generalized, generalized tonic-clonic seizure, the child's arms and legs may become rigid. <laughs> the back arches and the muscles twitch or jerk and spasm. The eyes roll up and become fixed. The pupils dilate and the breathing is often irregular or ineffective. The patient may lose bowel and bladder control and be completely unresponsive. If the seizure lasts long enough, the skin can turn cyanotic from ineffective respirations. The muscle spasms might prevent the child from swallowing effectively. Except, so you will see excessive saliva coming from the mouth. This is a common finding, okay? If saliva is trapped in the throat, the child may make a gurgling sound with respirations. While obtaining the history, ascertain whether the child has had prior seizures, and if so, find out whether this is the child's normal seizure pattern. Determine whether the child has taken their anti-seizure medications, if any have been prescribed. 
We also need to know how long the seizure lasted, okay? And when was their last seizure before today, all right? Seizures lasting longer than five minutes or recurring with no recovery between are considered prolonged seizures and are a true emergency. Seizures lasting 30 minutes or more are called status epilepticus. Provide positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen during a prolonged seizure, if possible, and even after the seizure has ended as necessary. Provide rapid transport to the hospital, paying attention to maintaining the airway and protecting the patient from injury. Y'all, please don't stay on scene with these people seizing for 30 minutes, okay? You either need to transport them or you need to get ALS there so we can give them some uh, anti-seizure medications, okay? All right, just like everything else, uh, establish and maintain an open airway, extend the head only enough to allow the airway to open, uh, provide, uh, protect the kid or child from injuring themselves, suction secretions, positive pressure ventilation, um, check their blood glucose level, okay? Even in an adult patient with a seizure, you need to check their glucose levels. Um, your body is expending a large amount of energy and your body runs on what? Energy and oxygen, okay? So our muscles are using up all of that glucose and we need to figure out if um, we need to give you something to help your blood glucose, all right? Altered mental status. Uh, your pediatric patient could have an altered mental status for the same reasons an adult patient would, such as hypoglycemia, poisoning, post-seizure, or severe blood infection. If your protocol permits, assess the blood glucose in any patient presenting with an altered mental status. This is pediatric or adult. This is especially important in the pediatric patient. Note that if the altered mental status is associated with poor brain perfusion or, or brain injury, all three pediatric assessment triangle findings, appearance, work of breathing, and circulation might be abnormal. The child's level of maturity can greatly influence, influence the format of the ENT's assessment of the mental status. Using the AFPU or the Glasgow Coma Scale, modify them for a child. Ask the child simple questions. If the child appears uh, to be uh, lethargic, inconsolable, or agitated, ask the caregiver if this is typical or an unusual response. To assess the unresponsive infant, or child shout to elect a response to verbal stimulus. Inflict a pinch to see if the child responds to pain. Never shake an infant or child for any reason. Uh, there should also be a, a pediatric GCS chart in your book. All right, you may need to look over that. Treatment of pediatric patients with an altered mental status is aimed at managing life threats Life threats such as airway compromise. Maintain an open airway. Keep your oxygen equal to or greater than 94%. Positive pressure ventilation if needed. Position the patient on their side. Be prepared to suction and transport and consider ALS intercept. Okay, These are the same steps we just went, went through. All right, drowning. We've kind of covered this in a, another chapter. Uh, drowning can occur in any amount of water from the ocean to bathtub to a bucket. The main cause of death in infants and children who are submerged is not the aspiration of fluid. Although it can occur in some patients, rather it is the hypoxia that occurs secondary to gl the glottic closure reflex, which occurs when the water contacts the glottic opening. After an initial period of glottic closure, the victim becomes hypoxic and ultimately gasps, leading to aspiration of water in the lungs. Okay, most of your drownings will be dry drownings. All right, there is a difference between wet drownings and dry drownings. Most of the time, they will find that during autopsy. All right, a dry drowning is when the glottic closes, there's no water in the lungs, and a wet drowning is when the glottic opens they inhale water under they inhale underwater and the water gets in their lungs okay when confronted with a drowning emergency be aware of the possibility of trauma and or hypothermia 
Infants and children are especially prone to hypothermia in any drowning emergency. Be alert for secondary drowning syndrome, a deterioration that takes place after normal breathing is restored. This can happen from minutes to hours after the event. If you come into contact with a child or an adult who is rescued from a near drowning, they need to be transported to the hospital, okay? In a cold water drowning, be particularly aggressive and persistent about resuscitating a pediatric patient. In response to the cold water, we have a mammalian dive reflex, which is pronounced in children. It might slow the blood perfusion and metabolism. This means that the residual oxygen in the blood lasts longer for the brain to consume. Numerous cases of saves have been reported even after prolonged submission in cold water, which is 30 minutes or more. It is controversial whether these saves are made possible by, possible by the mammalian dive reflex or the cold water. If unclear about the length of time underwater, always give the patient the benefit of the doubt and initiate resuscitation. Okay, you are not dead until you're warm and dead. Okay, I don't care if that's a kid, an adult, a child, everybody. You're not dead until you're warm and dead. All right. So, uh, that we just went over. Fever. <coughs> Fevers of 104 degrees to 105 are concerning. Causes include infection, heat exposure, seizures, and dehydration may occur, all right? And a lot of times, um, people have um, the wrong idea about febrile seizures. It's not how high the seizure gets. It's how fast the, seizure, the fever rises, okay? Um, the degree of temperature is not always of the greatest concern, but how quickly the temperature spikes. Oh, I just said that. If the temperature rises rapidly, a febrile seizure uh, might result. Not all high temperatures produce seizures. In addition to seizures, another common result of fever is dehydration caused by the increased insensibility, uh, insensible loss of fluids and electrolytes, especially if the fever has been present for some time. If the elevated body core temperature is a result of exposure to a hot environment, conduct cooling if the core temperature is ex um, greater than 104. All right, remove the child from the hot environment and avoid extreme cooling and shivering while cooling. Sponge the child's skin with tepid water. What does tepid water mean? Uh, it's, it's not hot and it's not cold, okay? It's room temperature water, all right? Transport the patient and remain alert for seizures. If cooling is done, it should be performed in a slow, controlled manner unless the child has a temperature above 106.9. If a child with an elevated core body temperature is cooled too quick, the brain will overstimulate and the child will or might have seizures. All right, there's your protocol for that. All right, meningitis. What is meningitis? An infection of the lining of the brain and spinal cord. Fever in infants younger than three months are suspected or susceptible to meningitis, and it can be rapid onset and fatal. All right, meningitis causes the meni, men, huh, meningeal tissue to swell inside the skull and around the spinal cord, causing an increase in pressure inside the skull and compression of the brain. All right, signs and symptoms of meningitis in children include recent ear or respiratory tract infections, high fever, uh, lethargy, lethargic irritability, or vomiting. They generally do not have headaches or stiff necks, but are lethargic and will not eat. The fontanel may be bulging unless the child is dehydrated. Movement is painful, so the caretakers might report that they cry every time we pick them up and they may have a rash that is present. If you suspect meningitis, you should wear a mask, gloves, and possibly a gown as the infection is spread by respiratory droplets. Complete the assessment rapidly and transport to the hospital. If the child is in shock, establish and maintain an open airway, administer oxygen, and maintain an SpO2 of 94% or greater. 
If the breathing is or becomes inadequate, use positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen. Transport, transport, transport. All right, GI disorders. These conditions include gastroenteritis, which can lead to dehydration and appendicitis. Maintain an SpO2 greater than or equal to 94%. Place the patient in a position of comfort and anticipate uh, vomiting and transport. All right, poisonings. For these patients, a thorough secondary assessment is critically important because poisons can enter through the body through numerous routes. They can be ingested, inhaled, absorbed, or injected. Gather as much information as possible about the type of overdose prior to transporting the patient to the hospital. All right, and it's also a good uh, rule of thumb for poisonings and stuff to always contact um, the poison control center. All right. All right, um, let's see. Emergency treatment of poison patient focuses on the effects of the poisoning on the patient rather than treating the specific type of poison. If the patient is initially unresponsive or it becomes unresponsive en route, you need to establish and maintain an open airway, adequate ventilation, and oxygenation. Administer oxygen to maintain an SpO2 at or equal to greater than 94%. If the breathing becomes inadequate, begin positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen. All right, expedient transport, perform a rapid secondary assessment uh, to rule out trauma as cause of the altered mental status. Check their glucose level if your protocol permits. Your protocol will permit this, all right? And here's your protocol for pediatric poisonings, all right? Um, let's see. Brief resolved unexplained events is an episode that is frightening to the observer in infants younger than one year of age. It's characterized by some combination of apnea, color change, marked changes in muscular tone, choking, and gagging. This event is usually transient, okay? Um, it just happens. All right, maintain an open airway, adequate breathing. If called for, if the infant is exhibiting any of these transient signs, establish and maintain an open airway. All right, apply positive pressure ventilation for inadequate breathing and transport with ALS intercept. All right, Sid, sudden infant death. Uh, sudden, inf sudden and unexplained death of an infant in which an autopsy fails to identify as the cause of death. Peak incident at two to four months. The exact known, uh, exact cause of this is unknown and we cannot diagnose this in the field, okay? All right, um, because this might be a potential crime scene rather than a medical case of SIDS, be careful not to convey by wording of your questions or your manner, any suspicion that the parents or caretakers might be responsible for the child's uh, condition, all right? Some things we want to look at, the physical appearance of the infant, where the infant is in the crib, the physical appearance of the crib, the presence of objects in the crib with the child, and any unusual or dangerous items in the room. Most of us know what we're going to nursery for the most part, okay? Um, attempt resuscitation unless rigor mortis or dependent lividity is present, all right? We don't do the um, codes for families anymore, okay? Um, a lot of times when people see you coding somebody, they automatically think where well, you're gonna bring them back. That almost, is uh gives them a false sense of hope okay and that's not something that we want to do all right we um pretty much just tell them that there's um nothing else that we can do uh we encourage them to talk um if you do transport transport with als backup or intercept and use uh caution in your communications with um, family members, okay? Um, so the reaction of family members 
in a SID incident will be varied. Uh, one of the most common immediate reaction is shock and disbelief. This can cause family members to become immobilized or incapable of making decisions, or it can cause them to act as if they are cold and unfeeling. It is not that they do not care, just that they are having a hard time facing reality, okay? Um, after one of these incidents, don't neglect your own emotional turmoil. After a SIDS call, it is common for rescuers to experience anxiety, guilt, or even anger. Ignoring your emotions will not cause them to go away. You should talk it out with colleagues, friends, or your partner or spouse, all right? So... Uh, several scientific studies conducted within the past uh, suggest the presence of parents during resuscitation is beneficial to children and the parents. When a child died during resuscitation, parents in one study felt that they had more acceptance of the death if they were with the child at the time of death. Children who survived appeared to be more cooperative and accepting of procedures when their parents were present. This study also found that there were minimal negative effects of the success rate of clinicians who performed the interventions, okay? So that's something that we kind of need to think about if you are going to uh, work one of these, uh, well, let me not say if, but when, okay? You stay in this long enough, you will have a win. All right, pediatric trauma. Jesus, this is a long chapter. All right, thousands of children uh, die from unintentional injury and are more permanently disabled. Trauma is the leading cause of death from ages 1 to 14. 50% of deaths from trauma occur within the first hour after an injury, and many of the deaths and injuries are actually preventable, okay? These are things that we can actually prevent, all right? Common modes of injury, unrestrained MVC. Uh, pedestrian versus vehicle, cyclist versus vehicle, water accidents, burn trauma, sports injuries, and child abuse, okay? When assessing the mechanism of injury during the scene size up, look not only at the vehicle or other object that caused the trauma, but also the size of the patient in relation to what they came in contact with. Blunt trauma is the most common injury in children, okay? There's not a whole lot we can do about blunt trauma except get them somewhere um, trauma, the definitive care is nine times out of 10 surgery. That's where they need to go. A pediatric surg surgical center. Because of the difference in infant and children anatomy as compared to adult anatomy, there are some special considerations for the assessment of the patient, an infant or child trauma patient. Head injuries are common in children because of the relatively larger size of the child's head compared to their body. Infants and children have ribs that are more pliable than adult ribs. This means that young patient, patients are less likely to suffer rib fractures, but more likely to sustain internal uh, damage, which lung injury, heart wall injury, because the ribs do not protect these structures very well. The abdominal muscles are not as developed in the child, so they cannot offer as much protection from blunt trauma. The presentation of injuries to the extremities is the same for infants, children, and adults, and assessment and treatment of them is essentially the same. However, you should be sure to use the appropriate size spine motion restriction equipment rather than trying to makeshift an adult device fit an infant or a child. Uh, kids under the age of five suffer more severe consequences from burns than do older children and adults. They are more at risk for hypothermia, fluid loss, and other effects, partially because their greater skin surface in relation to their body. Okay. All right. This is a relatively large laceration on the side of this kid's head. All right. Facial injuries are common. All right. And... Facial injuries, we all know, are airway compromise. Airway is especially vulnerable. As with adults, the priorities in treating an infant or child trauma patient center around airway management, breathing, and circulatory support. 
Because the child resist restraint laws, EMTs will encounter most children involved in motor vehicle crashes who are in child safety seats. These seats, if properly installed, are designed to hold a child in place during impact, particularly from head-on or rear-end collisions. Their effectiveness in broadside or rotating crashes is not yet clear. A survey of caretakers by the National Save Kids campaign found that one half of all children are either buckled incorrectly into a child safety seat or don't use restraints at all. The most common mistake caregivers make includes using an inappropriate seat size for the child, improperly threading the seat belt through the seat, and failing to make the safety strap fit snugly enough. All right. Um, if the seat was involved in a moderate to severe crash, do not use it to transport the child. If the crash was minor, the seat may be used if certain criteria are met. Okay, if you inspect that seat and you cannot find anything wrong with it, um, you could uh, more than likely go ahead and use it, okay? But if that seat's got any kind of broken pieces, you need to not use it, all right? Um, when you pull up on scene, one of the first things that people are going to tell you is, hey, here, here's this kid. They were in their safety seat, and I just snatched them out of it, okay? This is the worst thing a bystander could do, all right? Um, removing the infant or child from a car seat, the vehicle was able to be driven away from the crash site. The vehicle door nearest the safety seat was undamaged. There were no injuries to the occupants, no airbag deployment or damage to the seat was noted. Even if these things are met 100%, those bystanders are still going to snatch that child up out of that seat. If a child must be removed from a car seat, it must be done in a coordinated manner, maintaining inline stabilization of the spine. All right, the do's and don'ts of transporting children on an ambulance, which include the following recommendations that are still applicable to transportation of children. Do tightly secure all monitoring devices and equipment. Do ensure that available restraint systems are used by you and other occupants, including the patient. Do transport children who are not patients properly restrained in an alternate passenger vehicle whenever possible. Do not leave monitoring devices and other equipment unsecured in moving EMS vehicles. Do not allow parents, caregivers, EMTs, or other passengers to be unrestrained during transport. Do not have the child or infant held in the parent, caregiver, or EMT's arms or lap during transport. Do not allow emergency vehicles to be operated by persons who have not completed the DOT Emergency Vehicle Operations course, the National Standard Curriculum, or its equivalent. Okay. It is necessary that EMTs, <coughs> I'm sorry, EMS services are planned for situations that involve the transport of children. One such situation might involve an infant or child at the scene of an injured or ill adult who must be transported with the patient because no other caregiver is at the scene who can care for the child. Another situation may involve multiple patients who might require transport such as a mother and one or more newborns. All right, here's your pediatric trauma, the do's and don'ts, okay? All right, if an appropriate child restraint is not available and the child must be transported, adult equipment such as the KED or a life product can be modified to provide spine motion restriction. Uh, when you must secure an infant or a child to a stretcher, be aware that most straps attached to the stretcher are designed to accommodate an adult. All right. One way to accommodate children and infants is to use a four-point safety harness. Um, we actually do carry these where I work. All right. It's kind of like a um, mesh kitty seat, and you use the straps to secure them in. It's like a mesh car seat, except it's not it's not hard or anything. All right, this is how to backboard them. We've already gone over this. Um, all right, injury prevention. Preventable childhood injuries account for 44% of deaths 
between the ages of 1 and 19 years. Injury prevention must be a paramount concern to EMS providers. All right, child abuse and neglect. All right, uh, this is one of the hardest things that you will come across um, during your career in EMS. Uh, physical abuse takes place when improper or excessive action is taken to injure or cause harm. Sexual abuse indicates the involvement of a child in sexual activities for the gratification of an older, more powerful person. Neglect is the provision of inadequate attention or respect to someone who has a claim to that attention. An emotional abuse takes place when one person shames, ridicules, or embarrasses or insults another to damage the child victim's self-esteem. The adult, often a caregiver, who abuses a child often behaves in an evasive manner. All right, volunteering limited, inconsistent, and contract contradictory information and describing what happened to the child. The caregiver may show outright hostility towards the child or another caregiver and rarely shows any guilt. An abused child often shows fear and reluctance when asked how to describe or how the injury occurred. All right, general indications of abuse and neglect. Multiple abrasions, lacerations, incisions, bruises, or broken bones. Multiple injuries or bruises in various stages of healing, okay? Um, you'll have some bruises that are red in appearance, and then you'll have some that kind of look green, black, purple, all right? Those are the various stages of healing. Injuries on multiple planes of the body, any kind of unusual wounds or patterns of injury, and a fearful child, all right? Uh, any kind of injuries to non-bumper areas, such as the genitals, abdomen, back, buttocks, ears, and neck. Injuries to the brain and spinal cord occur when the infant or child is violently shaken. All right, this is called shaken baby syndrome. Injuries that do not match the mechanism of injury described. Uh, any kind of lack of adult supervision. And actually, untreated chronic illnesses like diabetes and seizures. Okay. Malnourished and unsafe living environments, a delay in reporting abuse, implausible explanation based on a child's development level, okay? And just so you know, uh, we're fixing to go through some uh, pretty graphic uh, photos here. It just kind of shows some of the things to look for, all right? So this is radiator bar burns on a child's butt. Okay, he would not normally do this to himself, all right? If you see this, you need to be um, very, very suspicious, all right? This is uh, injuries from a switch on the thigh of a school-aged kid, all right? Loop mark on a school-aged child from being whipped with an extension cord, All right, emergency care. Involve law enforcement if the scene is dangerous or you cannot get access. Do not ask the child what happened while they are in the crisis environment. And you always wanna perform a head to toe exam. Make observations as if this is the scene of a crime, okay? All aspects of patient care should occur without confronting or alerting the possible perpetrator that these injuries are suspected to be that of child abuse or neglect. All right, take the kid to the hospital. Do not question the caregivers about abuse or make any kind of accusations. Do not allow the child to be alone with the suspected abuser. And just remember, as an EMT, you are a mandatory reporter of abuse, any kind of abuse, child abuse, um, elderly abuse, anything like that, okay? Document objectively, record details, and keep information confidential. All right, so special considerations. All right, emergency medical services for children is designed to ensure that all children have access to appropriate emergency care. This was established in 1984, and it has provided grant funding to all states. Family-centered care. Advocates open 
Advocates open communication with family members throughout the assessment and management of the child. EMS providers must be able to anticipate the psychological and emotional needs of a child. Caring for infants and children can be stressful because of lack of experience in treating them, fear of failure, and identifying patients with your own kids, okay? Um, I don't have kids, but this is probably one of the hardest things for me to do is actually take care of an infant or kid. Uh, it's stressful for me. I don't have a lot of experience in treating them. Uh, I also have that fear of failure and I don't really identify with the parents, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's a stressful situation all the way around. Okay. You're trying to take care of the kid. You're trying to, uh, make sure you get, uh, information from the parent, uh, to help you take care of their kid. So to reduce stress, realize that much of what you know about adults applies to kids with variations in techniques. Practice your skills and focus on the task at hand. All right, Ben applies immediate inline spine motion restriction of the patient's head, uh, reassuring them as he does so. Deb checks the radial pulse. Now that the patient's skin is cool and clammy, the radial pulse is rapid weak at a rate of 116. Deb places an oxygen mask on the patient, then completes a rapid secondary assessment. In addition to suspected femur fracture, she also suspects a spinal injury. The EMTs provide spine motion restriction precautions and secure the patient to a long backboard and begin transport to the emergency department. Deb takes special care to keep the patient warm and reassesses vital signs every five minutes. All right. And they get to the hospital and um, the kid probably has surgery on their femur and their um, abdominal. All right, so there's part two of chapter 38 and I'm getting ready to do chapter 39, which is geriatrics.